is the first top 10 matchup involving Pac-12 teams since 2016. I was surprised by that as well, I might add, because I do feel like there have been some good teams, but the first top 10 matchup between Pac-12 foes in six years. Remember, that was the last year the Pac-12 sent a team to the college football playoff. Hello and welcome to Always College Football. Today is Friday, October 21st, and we hope you're enjoying the show wherever you're getting the show, whether it's on ESPN's YouTube channel or if you're here with us via the podcast, please like, rate, and subscribe. It helps us out. It really helps out the show. I'm Greg McElroy. Along with me, as always, is Mark Kubiak. We have a great game plan in store for you today, just like we do every Friday. We're going to dive into some of the biggest matchups on the field this weekend. And we're going to, of course, hit the questions about the five games you don't want to miss as well. So we're not going to waste any time. Let's dive into it. Let's talk about it. Every college football season, Goodyear knows the importance of winning on the road. The road will always demand confidence, the confidence to handle whatever the journey brings and to perform under tough conditions. And just like the players and the fans of college football, Goodyear is ready. Are you ready for the road? Visit Goodyear.com to find the right Goodyear tires for whatever road you're on this season. Goodyear, more driven. All right, give me five. We have five great matchups this weekend in college football. There's more than that, I know, but in the best interest of time and efficiency, we're going to try to hit the biggest games on paper heading into the college football weekend. As far as the big picture is concerned, there's a ton of games. We'll dive into those a little bit later on. More questions about big teams, big matchups coming up in just a minute, but there's five specific matchups that might have a huge impact on the remainder of the college football season, which is why we're going to start with Ole Miss and LSU. This is a game and a matchup that's been very interesting of late. The home team has won eight of the last 10 in the series. And of course, this year, they are heading to Baton Rouge. Let's start with Ole Miss. They are the highest ranked team in the matchup itself. Right now, they have joined both Tennessee and Georgia among the nine remaining unbeaten FBS teams. They are off to their first 7-0 and in start since 2014. Of course, that was vacated, but that season opening win streak actually ended in Baton Rouge back in 2014. They lost that game 10-7. So they were off to an amazing start seven, eight years ago, nine years ago, and then, of course, came up a little bit short on the road in the bayou. Of course, that was uh, still a pretty good year for Ole Miss. That's for sure a a two-year stretch where they were really off the charts good. So replicating that success is saying an awful lot. Let's talk a little bit about what Ole Miss does that makes them difficult to play against. They can run the dang football. They are third in college football right now on the ground. The two teams in front of them are academies. Okay, Ole Miss can run the football. They call a run play more than 60% of the time. It's the highest rate in the Power Five this year. And it's really no wonder that both Kansas State And Ole Miss are the only Power 5 teams this season with a pair of 500-yard rushers. All right, I referenced the fact that they're third in college football, running the football. They're averaging over 270 yards a game. They've obviously been very impressive. They also have the most touchdowns for running backs. That's at 24. Uh, Collectively, the top four... Three rushers for Ole Miss are averaging nearly six yards a carry, so it's not really doesn't really matter who's getting it. Might be Zach Evans, might be Quinshawn Judkins, Jackson Darts contributed some with his leg at the quarterback spot as well. So a very good rushing attack that a bunch of different people will kind of phase their way into the attack. Quinshawn Judkins has been one of the biggest surprises of the college football season. He has 10 rushing touchdowns. It's most by the Rebel through seven games in 30 years. He's a true freshman, y'all. And among the 37 FBS players with 100-plus carries this season, Ole Miss' Zach Evans ranks seventh and averaging over six yards a carry. And Judkins is right behind him at six yards per carry. So 6.1 for Evans, six for Judkins. Only a pair of service academies, Air Force and Army, have rushed for more yards per game this season. So um, we're looking at a really impressive offensive attack that's going to try to run the football. But when you can run the ball that efficiently, what does that open up? The passing game downfield. So Jackson Dart's going to launch it. That's what they do. They're off play action. Your whole defensive plan against Ole Miss is to stop the run, stop the run, stop the run. 
So when you're selling out against the run, that's going to open up some plays downfield. Jackson Dart right now is going to drive it downfield. And if you look at what they did last week, I think it's going to be very interesting if they can carry over some of that momentum. Rush, rush for nearly 450 last week against Auburn. That's a pretty decent defense, uh, at least in some ways. So you look at this performance, uh, I think it's going to be tough for LSU to corral, so they might have to score some points alongside like Auburn did last week. The good thing is LSU has been pretty good offensively. If you look at Jaden Daniels, he's completing nearly 70% of his passes has over 1,500 yards throwing it, 10 touchdowns against just one interception, and he's accounting for pretty much everything on this offense. I mean, it kind of all runs through him. He's got 33% of the rushing yards, 35% of the rushing attempts, and 32% of the rushing touchdowns. So if you look at, yes, of course, he's going to account for everything through the air as well, but Jaden Daniels is a guy that's going to absolutely be a huge factor in the game. What does it come down to? We're going to find out. Really going to find out, but here's a few things. One, Ole Miss has not been on the road yet this year. Okay, I know they have, but Georgia Tech, Vanderbilt, are those road environments that you're going to consider hostile? They haven't necessarily been on the road just yet this year. And you got to wonder, things really didn't look very good for them defensively last week. And I think Ole Miss, their defense still has some legitimate question marks. I think this game's a toss-up. I could see it going one direction or the other. I lean slightly in favor of Ole Miss, but really, really slight. I think it's going to be a heck of a game down there on the Bayou. If Ole Miss wins this one, do we start really looking at them as a possible playoff team? No, because they, they're, they're through this one. I'm sure not sure like nationally anyone really views LSU. Uh, I mean, think about it. it just... Tennessee just now got started, got considered a playoff team, right? Took beating Alabama to get there. They smoked LSU the week before. And no, I don't think anyone was talking about them as a playoff team just yet. So, no, I, I don't think they're there just yet. Um, of course, beating Alabama, I think, would welcome them to that conversation. And uh, they're going to have their shot, obviously, uh, a few weeks from now. Moving on to UCLA and Oregon, one of the games of the weekend and one of the best games we've seen on the West Coast in quite a while. This is the first top 10 matchup involving Pac-12 teams since 2016. I was surprised by that as well, I might add, because I do feel like there have been some good teams, but the first top 10 matchup between Pac-12 foes in six years. Remember, that was the last year that the Pac-12 sent a team to the college football playoff. Okay, so it's been a while. They had a couple of games in 2016, by the way, that involved top 10 teams. But man, it's been a while since we've seen a game of this magnitude being played amongst Pac-12 foes. UCLA's lost 12 in a row against AP top 10 teams. Their last win came in 2010 against number seven, Texas. It's been a while since the Bruins have been able to get it done in a big time game like this. Remember, UCLA has been on a fairly difficult stretch now, y'all. Three-game stretch in which they beat Washington, they beat Utah, and they're looking to win three state straight games against AP-ranked opponents for just the third time in school history. They did it in 2001. They did it in 1952. So it's been more than 20 years since they did it, and it's been 70 years since they did it the time before that. We're talking about an, kind of an uncharted territory here for UCLA as far as quality opponent, quality opponent, quality opponent. Three straight. If they can get it done, we're talking about a legit college football playoff contender. The other thing, too, it's the first time UCLA's had to leave the Rose Bowl. I mean, it feels like, you know, they had a road game. Yeah, but it was at Colorado. Not that dissimilar to what we just talked about with Ole Miss. Like, man, hey, no disrespect to Georgia Tech, no disrespect to Vanderbilt, but is Colorado going to provide the atmosphere that Autzen Stadium is going to provide? I mean, after all, more on Autzen in a minute, but Oregon's been pretty good at home for quite a while. The one reason why I feel really good about UCLA is we know their rushing attacks legit, but I love how Dorian Thompson Robinson displayed. Now there have been moments in his career that have been a little bit up and down, a little bit of a roller coaster, but right now he is second in college football in completion percentage, completing nearly 75% of his passes. You couple that with what they're doing out of the backfield with Charbonnet and Kaz, they have a lot of speed and they utilize a lot of misdirection. You know who also used misdirection against Oregon? That would be Georgia. And I think this is the best personnel by a fairly wide margin that Oregon's seen since that Georgia game. And we all know how that one went. Now, you look at where Chip Kelly's at. 
think we also have to acknowledge the fact that he's played or he obviously coached at Oregon in the past. Since he's taken over at Westwood, though, he's 0-5 against AP top 10 opponents. The most recent defeat coming against Oregon. And when he was in Eugene, he was a whole lot better against top 10 foes. He was 6-3 and three against top 10 teams when he was the head coach of the Ducks. Let's talk a little bit about Oregon. Bo Nix has been really good these last five games. Both teams, honestly, excellent running the football. UCLA is averaging 212 yards a game. Oregon's averaging 242. Both teams right now are averaging more than five and a half yards per carry. And what I love most, you have the top two rushing teams in the Pac-12 and the top two rushing defenses in the Pac-12 that are squaring off. So it's good on good. Let's see what happens. The opponent rushing yards per game, both teams are holding the opponent under 100. UCLA gives up 99. Oregon gives up 98. And then yards per rush, UCLA gives up 3.1 yards per carry. Oregon gives up 3.7. These are the tops in the Pac-12. So I think it's really going to be interesting to see exactly what unfolds. But man, when I look at everything and I look at every single aspect of this game, I know that the home field advantage for Oregon is significant. They've won 22 straight games in Autzen Stadium. That's the third longest streak in the country. The longest right now resides in Clemson, South Carolina. The second longest is in Cincinnati, Ohio. All right, those are the two longest win streaks. Autzen Stadium is third. However, I don't know who Oregon's beaten yet. I know they lost badly week one, and they've regrouped since then. But remember, it required a furious rally against Washington State, and I like Washington State, but a furious rally in the fourth quarter to pull off that game. And you couple it with the fact that they also smoked BYU, and that's when the goodwill kind of started up again for Oregon, but what has BYU proven to be kind of overrated at this point of the season? So I look at this game, I think UCLA is more battle-tested. I also think UCLA will utilize some of that misdirection in their run game, and I think UCLA gets it done on the road, ending that win streak for the Oregon Ducks in Autzen Stadium. All right, let's go next to Texas on the road in Stillwater playing against the Pokes. This is an interesting matchup here. The winner could find themselves in the driver's seat to get to the Big 12 championship game. Of course, there's another game in the Big 12. We'll talk about that in a minute. That's TCU and Kansas State. I mean, these the winner of these two games in pretty good shape when looking at what's coming up down the road in the Big 12. Let's start with Texas. Quinn Ewers enters Saturday's contest with a total QBR of 88. Remember, he's missed a few games, but amongst the qualifying quarterbacks, those quarterbacks that have started at least four games, He's seventh in college football in total QBR. All right. He also looks at, you know, the completion percentage and just how much he's pushing it downfield. 57% of his completions have gone for 10 plus yards. That's the eighth highest rate in the FBS. That's pretty impressive as well. And of course, he's got an unbelievable backfield mate in B. John Robinson of the I mean, among the 25 FBS players with a minimum of 125 touches this year, B. John Robinson is third most scrimmage yards per play at 6.6. Rocket Sanders at Arkansas and Israel Abanaconda there from Pitt are the two that rank right above B. John Robinson. But if I look at just how much teams are selling out against Bijan Robinson, it's almost like every defense corner is like, hey, man, we will not let that guy beat us. And yet he still finds a way That tells me all I need to know about what he's capable of. I think he's phenomenal. And I think Quinn Ewers has been really solid right next to him. Oklahoma State's a little bit more of a mystery to me at this point. I like what Spencer Sanders has done, but he's been a little bit erratic from time to time throwing the football. 70% of Spencer Sanders' throws have been determined catchable. That's 89th among 97 FBS quarterbacks with 150 pass attempts this season. His completion percentage is just 58.5%. That's 79th amongst those 97 FBS quarterbacks that qualify with 150 plus attempts. He's got to be a little bit more accurate. He's got to be a little bit more dialed in. And I think when they pushed the ball down the field, he was really sharp early. But the last couple weeks, he's come back to earth just a little bit. The big question, though, for Oklahoma State is their defense, man. You look at this Oklahoma State defense. If you look at the first six games of where they were at last year, yards per game, they allowed 307. That was last year. This year under Derek Mason, 437. 
Last year, yards per play, 4.7. This year, 5.5. Pass yards per game, 208 last year, 301 this year, and then the touchdown rate given up, 14% of the time they gave up touchdowns when their defense was on the field. That's possessions. This year, 24% of the time the opponent is scoring a touchdown as far as possessions are concerned. We're talking about a massive difference from one year to the next. And we all talked all off season about how good Jim Knowles was. We still acknowledge that he's doing a great job at Ohio State right now. But Derek Mason also extremely well respected amongst his peers and amongst us that follow the game closely. I think he does a really good job, but the proof has not been in the pudding just yet. They have to be better on defense because I think this could be one of the toughest tests they've faced to date. Texas offensive line's playing okay. They can run the ball. They can throw the ball. They're very physical. And I think after last week's close call against Iowa State, Oklahoma State better be ready to get Texas's best. I think you're going to get a good version of the Longhorns this week. I think the revenge door continues. I think they go into Stillwater and they steal a close one. I think it's going to be really tight all the way down the stretch. But Texas is a little bit more balanced on both offense and on defense. I think ultimately they can force a mistake or two from Spencer Sanders, which leads to them pulling off the big time road victory. All right, moving next to another game in the Big 12 that could very much determine who's going to represent in the Big 12 championship game. It's TCU. It's won three straight games, all against AP-ranked opponents for the first time in school history. With a win on Saturday, the Horned Frogs will join 2016 Oklahoma as the only Big 12 team to win four straight games within a season against AP-ranked opponents. It's pretty amazing the run that TCU's been on and the quality of the schedule that's been provided from the Big 12. TCU's been phenomenal, but this is a different animal. I think Kansas State is the real deal. Been a huge fan of theirs from the very beginning of this season. Been a huge fan of theirs, dating all the way back to when they were teeing things up in the preseason. We talked a little bit about how they might grow. We talked a little bit about how they might improve. We also talked quite a bit about how Adrian Martinez might be a different player here in 2022 with a fresh start there in Manhattan. More on Adrian Martinez in a minute, but let's start with TCU. They're the home team. Max Duggan has been one of the best stories in college football so far. Three-plus touchdowns in five straight games. That could be one of the best streaks in college football, and he's on pace right now to break the school record set by Trevon Boykin seven years ago. You look at Duggan, too. He's been very productive with ball security. Him and Caleb Williams are the two guys right now. They're the only ones in the FBS with an 85-plus total QBR while responsible for 20-plus touchdowns with just one or fewer turnovers. Okay, so Max Duggan, when you're in the same conversation as Caleb Williams, you're doing good things. Max Duggan, of course, was an All-American for us at the midway point when we did that show a couple days ago. I've been so thoroughly impressed with what he's done up to this point. But I tell you what, he doesn't have to do it alone. He's got a really good supporting cast. Got some excellent wide receivers on the perimeter, but don't sleep on Kendry Miller, who is just a, he's a really underappreciated back in there for the Horn Frogs, averaging six and a half yards a carry. That's the sixth most in the FBS this season. If you have at least 90 rushing attempts. So don't sleep on the balance that can be created by Sonny Dykes offense when they want it to be, all right? We all know there's a pass-first style of attack, but don't sleep on the run game. Even though he's from the air raid system, Sonny Dykes does have a decent complement of run game in his offensive style. Let's move over to Kansas State. Speaking of run game, we know they can get it done, all right? Offensively, Kansas State is all about controlling the line of scrimmage. They call run plays on 57% of the plays. It's the 13th highest rate in the FBS, why wouldn't you? When you got Adrian Martinez, when you got Deuce Vaughn, why wouldn't you run the ball over and over and over again? The other thing, too, when you look at their defense, this is one group that I've really enjoyed watching the last few weeks. They're sound, they're physical, and they allow touchdowns on just 13% of their opponent's drives. That's the eighth best rate in college football. That's a really solid group up front defensively. And if they can generate a little bit of a rush, if they can generate a little bit of a push, and you know Max Duggan, he can kill you with his legs too. He killed Oklahoma with his legs. That was on zone reads, a couple of scramble drills, but he is a very capable runner when given the opportunity. However, I think Kansas State is disciplined enough to not allow him to get out in space, not allow him to take it himself, and not allow him to create big plays with his legs. I also wonder too, psychologically, where is TCU right now? 
We just talked about the fact that they've played three straight ranked opponents. Well, honestly, if you go back even before those three games, they played SMU. And in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, TCU against SMU is a very significant game. TCU is going to be up for that game. They rallied for that game. So now you're expecting your team on five consecutive weeks to play their A game. That's asking an awful lot. It's asking an awful lot. I think this is the game where TCU doesn't have their best stuff, and I think Kansas State steals it on the road from the Horn Frogs as a slight underdog. I lean towards the Wildcats. That rushing attack, I think, can keep TCU's offense on the off the field. And I'm not sure TCU's seen a team that is as committed to the run game as Kansas State is going to be. This will be a different style of approach. This will be a very physical game. And I think TCU left it all in the field in that furious comeback last week against Oklahoma State. I think they're a little lethargic this week when they take the field and Kansas State ultimately gets it done. So you mentioned two Big 12 games and you have Texas winning and you have Kansas State winning, essentially eliminating the Big 12 from the playoffs. Is that correct? How you figure. Well, I mean, Kansas State has one loss, right? If Oklahoma State loses and TCU runs the table the rest of the way, they still have one loss. Do you think there's enough within that conference to beat a two loss team in the championship game to vault you into the top four? If you have one loss, I'm never going to say you're out of the playoff mix. As long as you have one loss, you're in the mix, no matter what. I'm not going to sit here and suggest that they're in great shape. They might need some help. For instance, they might need, say, Clemson to drop a game. They might need UCLA to drop a game. I'm not saying that they control their own destiny, but yes, I think Kansas State, if victorious this weekend, is still very much alive. I think TCU, even if they lose, is very much alive. I don't know if Texas has enough to get back but I do think Texas could find themselves in a spot down the road if there's, for whatever reason, catastrophic outcomes in some of the other leagues. Maybe Texas finds a way. But no, I think if you have one or zero losses, you are always in the playoff mix. But if you have any more than that, you're, of course, on the outside looking in. You might get in, but you'll be completely at the mercy of what happens in other places. All right, and finally, we'll get to a game that I'll be on the call for. I'm very excited. This will be my first whiteout. I actually have never actually done a game at Penn State. I've been to State College. This is the first time I'll have a chance to call a game. So I'm thrilled. This is a bucket list. Now I have two bucket list spots remaining. I haven't been to Iowa, and I haven't been to Nebraska. Those are my three that were left. I get to check off Beaver Stadium this weekend. But please send me to Iowa City, send me to Lincoln at some point, (laughs) because those places are at the top of my list. I've been very fortunate. I've seen a lot of cool spots. But man, I am thrilled to be able to be in the building for a whiteout. It's going to be really neat. Let's start with Penn State coming off a loss last weekend. Really, really a tough game to watch last week. Uh, If you're watching as a Penn State fan, come into the game, top seven defense in college football against the run. You've done a great job up to that point in limiting big plays against the run. You've done a great job in being able to create your own issues for the opposing team with your own run game, and yet it was all for naught. That was a very demoralizing game. Uh, Watching from a Penn State's perspective, it was a demoralizing game. They got exposed, and I think that was a troubling sight for anybody that watched that game last week. Their linebackers played out of position. They had multiple guys in gaps. Their run fits were less than stellar. And what was most concerning, man, it was just a vertical rushing attack from Michigan where they're attacking straight downhill and the gaps and the holes were enormous. Donovan Edwards, amazing. Blake Corm's amazing. But any single one of you listening could have averaged five or six yards a carry in that game based on some of the holes that were being opened up by the Michigan offensive line. Now, I told you earlier in the week, I think Michigan is as good, if not better, than anybody in college football right now, especially along the offensive line of scrimmage. That is the best offensive line in the country. The way that they're able to move people, the way that they're able to displace defensive linemen, and the way that they are kind of force you to make decisions at the second level that are difficult on linebackers. So I look at this, man, I think Penn State, maybe that was just a tricky matchup. Maybe you just didn't have your best stuff, but you better get back to playing great football this week because guess what? Minnesota can run the ball as well. Maybe not as well as Michigan. Maybe the offensive line isn't quite as good, but Moe Ibrahim is as good a back as you'll see, not just in the Big Ten, but in college football. You look at the one game that he was out, you could clearly tell that Minnesota 
was not the same team offensively. So a lot to consider there. If you can't stop that downhill rushing attack against Michigan, you better adapt and adjust because you're going to get a very similar rushing attack from Minnesota. Let's look a little bit at the quarterback situation for both teams. Both quarterbacks a little bit banged up. Maybe Aller gets the look or the nod over Clifford for Penn State. Got to wonder after Tanner Morgan left the game early against Illinois or in, early in the fourth quarter against Illinois last week, will it be Ethan Kalikamak, uh, Kalikamak, Kalik, Kaliak Manis? Ethan Kaliak Manis. I don't have the pronunciation right in front of me, by the way. I, I will come game time. Right now, he's just the backup quarterback. Ethan Kaliak Manis. All right, got it. Ethan Kaliak Manis. I also had to call DJ Uyangale's first start against Boston College a couple years back. The entire drive from Charlotte to Clemson, South Carolina, I practiced that name over and over and over again. That's about a two and a half hour drive. DJ Ui Ungalale. DJ Ui Ungalale. Ethan Kaliak Manis. Ethan Kaliak Manis. All right. I don't know who it's going to be a quarterback for either one of these two teams. All I know is that both fan bases have been starved, starved for improved, more consistent play at the quarterback position. The one thing that I would say about this is that it might be improved if a younger, more heralded, highly touted player is in the game. It might be improved. There are situations in which the younger player is, in fact, better than the older player. There are situations like that. We've seen it happen in the past. Shoot, there are plenty of examples that you know guys get their opportunity, and next thing you know, the starter gets Wally pipped. But I always seem to kind of trust the coaches in these situations. Like if for whatever reason Tanner Morgan can't go, sure, you don't have a choice. Ethan Kaliak Manis has to be your guy. If for whatever reason Sean Clifford can't go, Aller has to be your guy. Fine. But to just want the guy to go in there because he hasn't disappointed you is I think a very difficult situation to be in. All right. I understand everyone wants to see the young guy, especially if you think your season's lost. I mean, goodness sake gracious, you you listen to some folks following Penn State and Minnesota. It's like, all right, well, the season's over. How? I mean, Penn State's got one loss. What we just talk about with the college football playoff. Now, do I think Penn State can beat Ohio State playing the way they're playing right now? Probably not, no. So the likelihood of them having multiple losses here in a few weeks is increasingly high, but they still only have one loss. Still a lot to play for. And then meanwhile, for Minnesota, yes, is it likely they get to the Big Ten Championship game barring a collapse from Illinois and or potentially Purdue? Probably not, but still an awful lot to play for. Still an awful lot of guys that are that are that came back to be a part of this Minnesota program. So I'm very optimistic about the effort we're going to get from both teams. Let's talk a little bit about the actual XO. The rush defense is obviously the biggest issue for both these teams. This is their bread and butter. Okay. Both teams want to run the football. We know that Mo Ibrahim is amazing for Minnesota, but we also know too. When you look at what Penn State has at running back with Singleton and Allen, they are legit one-two punch. If they get in the open field, it's game over. So Minnesota's defense, which is excellent, I might add, need to do a really good job tackling in the open field and not allowing those guys to hit into the third level with a full head of steam. But the defenses are concerning. You look at Penn State, first five games gave up just 400 rushing yards total. Against Michigan, they gave up 418. Yards before contact, okay? 80 yards before contact in the first five games combined. Against Michigan, 283 yards before contact. 10-yard rushes in first five games, they gave up 16. Against Michigan, they gave up 12. And then rushing touchdowns had given up only three leading into last week's game. They gave up four on the ground last week. That group needs to play much better. Expect Manny Diaz to have a new plan and expect them to be a lot more sound defensively. And then conversely for Minnesota, the rush defense, very disappointing last week against Illinois. This is a team that on average faces 51 offensive snaps a game. All right. So part of this falls on their offense too. They faced 80 something last week and that's not good enough. They had They gave up way too many fourth down conversions, way too many opportunities to extend drives, and they're going to have to be a lot better against a rushing attack that can certainly take the top off the defense. I'm not going to make a pick because I'm calling it, but it should be an outstanding one there from Happy Valley on Saturday night. 
All right. We hit all the biggest games of the weekend, but now there's still some unanswered questions. Let's get into some of these matchups where people are maybe a little bit uneasy about what they've seen in recent weeks. So let's put some people at ease. Let's make sure that you relax. Coops, kick it off. All right. Question number one here. Will Alabama clean things up at home and look like a national championship contender? You know, it's funny. I, I looked at at all the different times that Alabama's come off a loss in the Nick Saban era. And Mississippi State has been the team that they play the following week four times. That's an absurd number. <laughs> so they just always happen to be like in a position where Alabama's really ticked off. So take that as you may. Last year, they played Mississippi State after they played uh, A&M. This year, similar circumstances the week after. So I don't know why that is, but poor Mississippi State, they always seem to find Alabama uh, in a really angry position. In the last four meetings, Alabama has scored outscored Mississippi State 152 to 16. You heard that right. 152 to 16, two of those games being shutouts. And since Nick Saban's arrival, Mississippi State has scored double-digit points in just four out of the 15 games. You heard that right. Since Nick Saban's arrival, Mississippi State has scored double-digit points in just four of the 15 games. And think about this, man. This is a Mississippi State team that was at one point number one in the country with Dak Prescott. I mean, this is not a team that has had, you know, it's not it's not been the Mississippi State team of like a million years ago. This has been a good, steady, consistent, quality, physical Mississippi State football team. Now, no one's saying they're hitting the moon on Mississippi State, but that's never, it's not really a team that you can just roll over. And Alabama has fared really well. Since Mike Leach, has gotten to Starkville. It's actually been worse. They have had a ton of success pretty much everywhere else. But in the two games that Nick Saban's faced off against Mike Leach, the total score is 90 to 9. And that's a scary thought. I hate the matchup for Mississippi State. Hate it. Alabama can generate a rush with only three. They leave their tackles on islands. And yes, Mississippi State this year has been more committed to running the football. There's no doubt about it way more committed to running the football. But is it going to be enough to be able to get Alabama out of their three-down defensive line? I think that's probably going to be a little bit difficult for Mississippi State to get them out of that because they've had so much success playing that structure defense against Mississippi State at this point. I have had people ask me, hey, well, what is the look at how Tennessee lit them up through the air. Look at how Tennessee lit them up. Can Mississippi State do the same thing? Mississippi State's offensive identity is dinks and dunks. So when you look at, you know, how they matriculate their way down the field, Mississippi State averages five and a half air yards per pass attempt. That's third fewest in the FBS. So their average ball, when they throw the ball, it on average travels five and a half yards downfield. That's how short it is. It's all short underneath passing attack. Alabama does a few things really well. They tackle really well, and they're very good in coming up and making plays on the ball. And at some point, if you just run this same type of protection that Mississippi State's always run, that three-man rush with Will Anderson, Dallas Turner, and that cheetah package that Alabama has used recently, they're going to be able to generate some negative plays. Will Rogers was running for his life last year, and I don't know if it's going to be that different this year. 21 points a lot. I don't know if I feel confident enough to lay the points, but I think Alabama gets back on track in this game and shows that they are still very much a contender when it comes to getting to the college football playoff, winning the SEC West, and finding their way back into the mix for the national championship run. All right, moving on to Ohio State. Well, they keep dominating teams, and do we start comparing what they did to how bad Michigan beat the same opponent? Well, answer me this, uh, or anyone, maybe it's a rhetorical question. Is is Michigan getting credit for beating Iowa? Because that, to me, that would be news. Because I, I feel like Michigan-Iowa might be the most forgotten game of the college football season so far. I mean, it was kind of like a ho-hum. Michigan got a big lead, and then Iowa kind of you know, stormed back and made it a little interesting. But it was like, I don't know. I, it just was not for, for a game with big brands. And a game that would, you know, in a normal year, really move the needle, just didn't. 
I mean, I, I don't know why that well, might have been heavily watched. I don't know what the television numbers were for it. But as far as impacting the national narrative, no, there was almost no impact whatsoever. Like after that game, did you feel better about Michigan? Because I didn't. I, I didn't feel great about Michigan until I watched them dominate last week against a Penn State defense that I have respect for. I, it's a, that's a solid defense. And for them to gash them the way they did, that opened my eyes in a massive way. For Ohio State, if they go out and win by 30, I, I'm not going to really... In my opinion of them won't change. I, I think they're a good team. I think they're insanely, insanely explosive. I would love to see Jackson Smith and Jigba get back out there. I just want to see them at full strength. I don't feel like we've seen them at full strength all year long. And I'm not going to learn anything about the defense going against Iowa's offense. I mean, no disrespect to Iowa, but I don't think they can... They can't do anything offensively that is going to make life difficult on the Buckeyes. So everyone keeps telling me that Buckeyes defense is so improved. Look at how much better the Buckeyes defense is. Well, I just saw the team that they shut down in week one, Notre Dame, with a healthy Buckner at quarterback. I saw them get absolutely roasted by a Stanford defense that isn't good. So I, I'm trying to figure out, uh, you know, are the Buckeyes that much better on defense? I don't know, but I can tell you this. I won't learn anything this week. This game will be a comfortable win in favor of the Buckeyes. They'll continue to march along, and it's not their fault. The like Buckeye fans have been coming at me since I ranked them fourth a couple of days ago in, in my McElroy poll. Like, fine, be mad at me for having you fourth. But guess what? It's a good thing to be fourth still in the playoff mix and have the team that I have number one on your schedule coming up and you get them at home. So right now, their grade is incomplete. And this week is not going to adjust or fluctuate my opinion of them either way. They're insanely dangerous. They might be the best team in the country by the time it's all said and done. Their resume certainly doesn't back that up right now, but they have a ton of firepower and they're really fun to watch. So, I mean, that's where they're at right now for me. That's where they're going to be until they play against Penn State or they, until they play against Michigan. But uh, they go scorched earth on those teams. Then guess what? They'll vault up to number one or two or wherever they end up. So they're in great shape. Just keep doing what you're doing. But to make these jaw-dropping and sweeping conclusions about their improvements, y'all, we don't know yet. Thanks for the Notre Dame shade on that. Moving on. All right. Uh, can DJ and Clemson make plays against a very good Syracuse defense? The interesting thing about this game is I've seen way worse Syracuse teams give way better Clemson teams all they want. <laughs> you know? I mean, the best example being 2017 when the defending national champion Clemson went to the Carrier Dome and lost on a Friday night. Now, Kelly Bryant got hurt in the game. It was a weird game. Like, I, I get it. All right. But at that point, they lost on the road at a bad Syracuse team. I don't even know if they were bad that year. But either way, Syracuse and Clemson back in 2017 uh, with their personnel, Clemson had a lot of dudes, Syracuse, not so many. Moving into 2018. To prove it wasn't a one-year wonder, Trevor Lawrence got injured in the second quarter. In comes Chase Bryce. That was Trevor Lawrence's first career start. And Clemson actually trailed by 10 in the fourth quarter. They did come back to win 27-23, and they ultimately ended up winning the national championship that year. But Syracuse had them on the ropes with 15 minutes to play. They're at Clemson, a difficult place to play. So for whatever reason, Syracuse has kind of had Clemson's number in random years. This year doesn't feel that random. All right, we know last year, by the way, Syracuse and Clemson, I wasn't sold on Clemson, at least at this point. Clemson won the game, but it was 17-14, and Syracuse missed a 48-yard field, 48 field goal with 38 seconds left to push it to overtime. But either way, I mean, I'm not sure last year is a great you know, reflection of who Clemson is. Uh, who are they this year? I think it's going to really come down to whether or not DJ Uyunglele and this Clemson offense can create big plays downfield. I think both defenses are excellent. I think Syracuse is going to have a very difficult time consistently moving the football against a group that's so good against the run. Schrader's great. Tucker's great. They're going to run the ball. I don't know about their perimeter weapons. I think they're okay. But when you look at the downfield passing attack for Clemson, that's been a big part of their offense's attack this year. You look at where they were last year, just 32% completion on passes that traveled 15 plus yards downfield. This year, they're up around 46. Yards per attempt, 9.6 last year, 13.9 this year. Touchdown interception, uh, interception, five to four last year. This year, they're eight to nothing. So the downfield passing attack has been huge 
for Clemson this year to complement that run game, which is going to be rock solid. Couple that with the fact that Syracuse is excellent against downfield passes. Syracuse is holding opponents to an FBS best 22% completion rate on throws that travel 15 plus yards downfield. They've allowed just one touchdown on throws like that as well. So it's good. DJ throwing it downfield against good Syracuse defense on downfield passes. What gives? I don't know how Syracuse can manufacture enough offense to stay in this game. If Clemson coughs it up, if they get the short field, I could see it being a four quarter game, but I honestly don't know how Syracuse can consistently move the football. If Clemson shows up and plays well, they win the game and they should win it comfortably. All right. Can South Carolina get their first ever win against Texas A&M? They can. It will be difficult. With A&M, it's almost like you never really know what to expect. I know one thing about A&M that I know I'm going to get. I know Devon A. Chain is going to show up and be ready to play. Like I know that. All right. Everything else about Texas A&M feels a little bit hit or miss. And this does feel like a spot where A&M could play their best game of the year. I mean, it does feel kind of like a spot like that. I mean, that's been the track record, of course, right? We had uh, Shane Beamer on the show earlier this week, and he's like, man, I've never seen the, the Bonham Trophy. Okay, well, the Bonham Trophy, by the way, has only resided in Aggieland since 2014. The two have been designated as permanent crossover rivals. So South Carolina and Texas A&M, they play every single year in the SEC. Well, Bonham was a student at South Carolina. He died in the Battle of the Alamo during the Texas Revolution. So the trophy is named after him. But I don't know if South Carolina has the dudes to be able to get A&M going. I think, I think South Carolina has better offensive personnel at wide receiver at, to, at times. I think their quarterback's obviously better with Spencer Rattler. I think their run game is solid, really, really solid. Offensive line's okay, but I don't think they're going to be able to move this defensive line very much. That's going to be a big matchup, a and defensive line against South Carolina's offensive line. But I look at just how the, the receivers for a and kind of came into their own a couple weeks ago against Alabama. We know A-Chain can roll, and I feel like the defense for a and is much better than that of what you're going to get at South Carolina. I think it's a toss-up game. I lean a and slightly, but on the road in a place that's going to be going bonkers on a Saturday night, it's not a guarantee whatsoever. I think it's going to be a tricky game for the Yaggies, but if they show up and play well, they have superior personnel, and they should be able to get what might be a nail-biter on the road and keep the bottom trophy <laughs> at home, if you will. So they're still not going to get that trophy in there in the South Carolina. Okay, moving on. Last one here. Can Purdue follow in Tennessee's footsteps and break a 15-game losing streak to Wisconsin? Now, this is the longest active winning streak for the Wisconsin Badgers against a Big Ten opponent. All right, the Badgers' last loss in the series. This puts things in perspective, by the way. (laughs) Their last loss in the series came on October 18th of 2003. You know who the quarterbacks were that day? I'll give you a half second to think about it. 2003, Purdue and Wisconsin. Well, the starting quarterback for Wisconsin was Jim Sorge. Went on to be Peyton Manning's backup forever. And then the starting quarterback for the Purdue Boilermakers, Kyle Orton. That's how long it's been since Purdue has beaten Wisconsin. It's been a while. Aiden O'Connell is the straw that stirs the drink for Purdue. He's got to be great. And against Wisconsin, he has not fared well. Four career interceptions against Wisconsin, including three last year. It's the most career interceptions against one single opponent. So Aiden O'Connell's got to be really good with his decision-making. And you look at the run game for Wisconsin and how the offense has changed a little bit since Jimmy Leonard took over as the interim head coach. In the two games since he took over, they've had... 800 yards of offense, 798 to be exact, 800 yards of total offense. So about 400 a game. Well, in the five games since that's, you know, fourth in the big 10 over that span, I might add. Well, they gained 1,940 yards in five games under Chris. That's 10th among big 10 teams in that span. You're going to say, well, hang on 400 a game. It's pretty consistent. Yeah. Well, the competition has been better the last two weeks than it was in the first five weeks. And the offensive productivity as a result, I think is quite a bit better. 
So what gives here? Can Braylon Allen, who's phenomenal as a running back for Wisconsin, can he get things going? Can he make enough things miss this year? Make enough guys miss there in the front end for Purdue, who I think is a really good defensive front, really solid group against the run. I don't feel real confident in Wisconsin in this game. I just I know that Purdue has had their druthers in trying to get things done against the Badgers, but it just feels like Purdue's so much better than Wisconsin. I just I do not like what I've seen from the Badgers. I think they've been really up and down, and I don't know how you trust them. So I'm going to take Purdue in this game and hope that the streak comes to an end because I have really have not seen enough consistency from Wisconsin to think that they're going to get it done against a well-coached Purdue football team. So it should be a great one. Uh, and maybe for the Boilermaker fans, they can exercise some demons. All right, y'all, what a great show. Enjoy tomorrow. Please enjoy tomorrow. Y'all, we have six Saturdays left of the college football season. Yes, I know we still have Army-Navy. Yes, I know we still have Conference Championship Saturday. Yes, I know we have Semifinal Saturday. I know we have other games that will be played on Saturdays. I know we'll have Saturdays with college football. I get that. But there's nothing better than our regular season. We have six left. So buckle up and enjoy it. We have some big time games this weekend too. Games that could determine the outcome of whether or not a team's in playoff contention, could determine the outcome of whether or not a team's in prime position to get to their conference championship game. Even, you know, some great games in the group of five that we'll revisit because I don't feel like we've had much of an opportunity to talk about the group of five. Why? Because there just haven't been that many consistent group of five football teams. Man, we've had some great moments from the group of five. We've had some substandard moments from the group of five. So it's been strange this year. Usually it's a year that we can really get behind. But as these races and as these conference championships start to clarify, we'll be able to lock in. A little bit more for all of us here at Always College Football. Please like, rate, and subscribe wherever you're getting the content. If you're on the podcast, five star rating, subscribe. That'd be awesome. If you're on ESPN's YouTube channel, hit that little thumbs up button. Leave us a comment. If you disagree with something, it's fine. We're good. Everyone's got their own opinion on this. More than happy to listen to yours as well, but the comments help us out as well. You can also follow us on social media at Always CFB on Twitter or Instagram and hit us in our email at Always College Football at gmail.com. For all of us here at Always College Football, for Jack Foster, for Mark Kubiak, I'm Greg McElroy. We hope you have a wonderful weekend, and remember, it's Always College Football. Hey guys, it's Greg McElroy. Thanks for watching Always College Football. Make sure you like, rate, and subscribe to ESPN's YouTube channel and wherever you listen to your podcasts.